All right, hello, hello, hello. We are here to discuss The House Across the Lake by Riley Sagar. Um, now, before I get too far into this video, the first part of this video is going to be a non-spoiler quick review of this book. So if you have not read it, but you are intrigued by it, I will give you some of my overall thoughts that are non-spoilery. And then we're gonna go into the vlog portion of this video, jump into first the non-spoilery review and thoughts. So this book follows Casey Fletcher, who is a disgraced actress. Um, she basically needed some alone time, so she escapes to this lake house that her family owns, and across the lake, a tech billionaire and a former supermodel named Tom and Catherine buy the house and move in, and Casey begins to watch them. Um, she's being very voyeuristic. Eventually, Catherine goes missing, and Casey suspects that Tom had something to do with her disappearance. Um, and then we also are getting backstory from a couple of other characters as well as Casey's backstory and how she ended up um, kind of secluding herself in this house. This I gave, I'm gonna give it three stars. So this is my least favorite Riley Sager so far. So if I had to update my list, um, I would say that the house across the lake is at the bottom. Then I would do Final Girls. Um, then I would do Survive the Night. Then I would do um, the, uh, Home Before Dark, then I would do Lock Every Door, and then I would do The Last Time I Lied. Bottom, I like this even less than Final Girls, which I thought was his weakest outing. That was his debut in mystery thriller horror writing. Um, and without giving a lot of spoilers, um, this book was kind of cliched in a lot of ways. There was just a lot of tropes that you suspected there you learn that Casey is a bit of an alcoholic she drinks bourbon and whiskey as her choice and at first I was like okay that's got to be like some sort of play on the trope of the you know lead heroine always being an alcoholic and watching her neighbors you know but no like that is the book that is what happens and you ultimately learn the reason why Casey is drinking but it it just still doesn't satisfy that particular um urge so yeah it's just it's it's frustrating that just this book was so cliched um and then ultimately i think goes completely off the rails in like a not fun way twists and turns that it takes to me just left me really annoyed i feel like this could have been done so much better could have been done so much smarter and ultimately it just was a bit of a flop for me still three stars like still not like a bad book i got through it i liked my time reading it but it's just it was not as engaging or entertaining as i wished it would be so that's it that's all i'm gonna say as far as the non-spoiler section so starting from here is gonna be spoiler thought so i will go ahead and jump you into my clips that i had filmed hopefully you enjoy this spoiler vlog and my thoughts on the book. Hello, it is now two days later since I started the book. So um, I started it Tuesday night. It is now Thursday morning. I'm running a summer camp this week. I think I talked about that. Um, so my days are like 6.30 to like six o'clock basically on campus. And then I also started a second job this week. Um, again, I'm um, my old second job. I wanted to give my thoughts on the book so far. First and foremost, the book opens up with a Taylor Swift quote from Nobody No Crime. Um, the quote was, I think he did it. I just can't prove it. <laughs> um, and so already like loving that. So the book basically is opening up or following. Um, we're following this woman named Casey Fletcher, who is currently staying in um, her family's like lake house on Lake Green in Vermont is where the setting or the story is taking place. Now in this lake house, we initially do not know why Casey has been made to live here. We get hints of it um, in the first couple of chapters that maybe she's not there by her own free will. Um, it kind of sounds like her mother put her there. And basically we, this is skipping forward a little bit, but um, I want to kind of go by, I guess, character by character a little bit. Um, and then maybe talk about some intersecting plot points. But we get Casey's backstory that her mother was a really famous um, actress and her father was a famous producer slash screenwriter. Um, and so they basically met, had Casey, 
Casey's father then um, died when Casey was 14. And Casey is explaining how she was never close to her mother and her mother really only cared about her career. And so when her father died, it was really hard for her because she felt like she didn't have a parent left to parent her um, and to kind of be that support system that a parent should be for a child, especially a teenager. Um, and so Casey explains how she started going out and using drugs and getting um, just herself in bad situations from the early, from the ages of 14 to 19. Um, and then she eventually stopped, um, got herself clean and everything, and then started being an actress herself. Starred on Broadway. Um, she did a few kind of minor roles and things like that here and there. Um, so she, I would say, was probably like a C-list actor, actress, celebrity. Casey met and fell in love with this guy named Len, who eventually became her husband. Um, and we find out pretty early on in the book that Len actually drowned um, at Lake Green. So when Casey is speaking to her mother over the phone, she's like, why would you send me here knowing that this place is very traumatic for me? And Casey's mother's basically like, boo-hoo, get over it. Um, because after Len died, Casey was starting starring in a Broadway production. Basically had become a alcoholic at that point and she went on stage drunk, forgot her lines, and basically passed out and had to be carried off stage by some of her co-stars. Now is trying to uh, just get herself a little bit better, which um, initially, you know, I, when I opened the book, I read the first couple of lines and immediately we kind of get this imagery of Casey as she's drinking bourbon is her, you know, personal brand. So I was like, okay, this is a little cliche. Like, I feel like Riley Sagar is going to sub sub subvert this a little bit, but I don't know if he actually is. I think she just made his protagonist an alcoholic. Now the premise of the book, the book opens up with Casey being interviewed by a detective named Detective Wilma. And we um, find out that both Catherine and Tom Royce are married. Now Catherine are missing, excuse me. Catherine and Tom are married, obviously. And they bought the house across the lake <laughs> from Casey earlier in the year. That we're about fall time right now. So they bought it, I think, in September. And then that portion of the story is taking place in October. And now Casey is introduced to Catherine because she is looking out on the lake and she kind of sees something. And so she goes out there and she thinks she sees someone drowning. And obviously she's very traumatized from Len drowning on the lake. So she runs over and she saves this woman who ends up being Catherine, who explains that she is a former model, who she's married, um, this like tech guy named Tom Royce. And you're getting a little bit about their kind of marriage and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's not super interesting, but what is kind of intriguing is flashing back to that little prologue we have after Casey is being finished, interviewed by Detective Wilma. We walk upstairs and Casey has a man, it's not a fight who, tied to the bed and she says, what did you do to Catherine? I suspect that this is where kind of our midpoint turn of the book is going to be and who we're going to find out this man is. I don't think it is Tom. Um, that is tied up to the bed because I feel like he would have been named otherwise and right now in the rest of the book it's obviously being set up that it is Tom so I just don't think that it would be. Now we were introduced to another male character whose name is slipping my mind at the moment because it was literally the last chapter that I read but he basically is contract a contract worker for another couple um, on this lake who he's fixing up their lake house. He's been there since August in case he makes a comment like Oh, well, it's now like, well, I guess, I guess we are reading in October, so maybe my timeline is a little off because she's like, oh, you know what, house renovations takes nearly three months. A little suspicious of him. Um, there's also uh, another male character who is also another resident of the lake, um, Lake Green, like I said, in Vermont. Uh, also, something very weird is that this woman, Catherine, decided to go swimming inside a lake that is in Vermont in October? Like, that doesn't make sense to me, girl. That is freezing. And she's like, oh, I do the polar bear plunge all the time every year. Like, yeah, that's like getting in now real quick. Last piece of kind of information or plot that I wanted to share with you is that um, Casey was actually spying on Catherine and 
um, Tom through, because their house is all windows, obviously, like, would you expect anything else? Um, but she basically sees that Tom is working upstairs, he's going into the bathroom, looks like he's going to take, like, maybe a shower, a bath of some sort, and so she notices that Catherine's kind of listening for him, doesn't really hear him, so she goes to make a phone call, and she's, like, kind of... I think the words used were urgently speaking, um, but Casey suspects that she's just leaving a voicemail and not actually speaking to anyone on the other line. Um, and so Tom kind of hears something and comes downstairs and sneaks up on Catherine and she like hides the phone from him when he sneaks up. And that's when Casey is interrupted by this other contractor man. So we don't kind of get the, we haven't gotten the fallout of that yet. Um, and kind of learned what that was all about or what happened. And that's kind of like the major plot things that have happened right now. And so far, I am really enjoying it. Um, I think it's definitely a vibe, um, kind of being a wintry-ish, fally book. It's definitely not summer vibes like a lot of other Riley Sagar books I feel like are summery, even if they don't take place in summer. So maybe I'll get the same feeling from this one at the end but right now it's very like fall cozy ish because it's kind of rainy it's in vermont it's in an isolated setting i definitely like this the the trope of an isolated setting and i like that what this one is doing um kind of being in an isolated setting but still giving room for our characters to spread out and breathe a little bit right now the biggest mysteries is obviously what happens to Catherine. Uh, where is she? Where is she going? Who's the man tied to the bed? Is it Tom? Is it one of these other men that have been introduced in the story? Um, so far, the only two female characters in the timeline that we're in that have been introduced that are at least at the lake house are Catherine and um, Casey, obviously. And then, of course, we'll get introduced to Detective Wilma in a minute, I'm sure. And then we have Casey's mother. And then Casey also has a cousin named Marty, who she's very close with. Oh, one last theory-ish that I have is I don't know if Casey's husband is actually dead. I mean, I would imagine so, because apparently his body was found by uh, and saw by other people. She said that um, her uncle or I forget, there was a man. Oh, and I think it was that other guy. Um on the lake like the other man um not the contractor guy the other one i wish i could remember either of their names i'll get them down um he and the police uh, identified the body on her behalf so while i think it would be very difficult to fake a death at that point i'm not gonna put it past them so yeah that's where i'm at right now hello please excuse my look it is um wednesday it's currently dust storming outside so i have a bit of an orange tint to myself excuse me i am now 181 pages into the house across the lake i have not updated you in a while and i have not continued to read until i was going to update you in the last clip i was describing two men who i could not remember their names that we've been introduced in the story um, but one of them is len the older neighbor from across the lake and the other is Boone. What has happened so far, main plot points, is we just kind of saw Casey um, getting closer to Catherine. Um, we saw her observing the house a couple of times. We also were a couple of times mentioned some girls that had gone missing, um, so I knew that was going to play into the story at some point. And um, we are now to the point where Casey and Boone have kind of teamed up because Catherine has gone missing and they think that Tom had done something to Catherine. They've gotten this friend involved, the detective Wilma, who has finally made her introduction into the timeline of the story. Um, and she basically comes over to Casey's house and her and Boone um, know each other. They used to work together because Boone is a former police officer. He lost his wife in a mysterious accident. His wife fell down the stairs and he went into a bit of a um, spiral and was relying on alcohol, but he is now in recovery. Brings Wilma in. She kind of says at first, like, hey, we can't really do anything about this. And then they come back after, or Boone and Casey call Wilma back after they see Tom entering his house carrying some suspicious looking hardware store purchases. Like, I think he bought rope, tarp, a saw, something of that nature. Wilma was like, can I trust you two? <laughs> and which was just weird. It was kind of a weird thing. But um, they basically think that Tom may have be this serial killer who is picking off girls in this kind of area of Vermont. 
Um, I think there is three girls that have gone missing and or have been found dead. Personally, my own personal theories on that is I think it obviously is either Len or Boone, um, who is actually the serial killer. That would just make the most sense as far as a twist. We also are still getting chapters of a man tied up to the bed. We still do not have confirmation who this man is, so that just leads me further and further to think that it is not Tom. Um, I do have this other crackpot theory that it might be her husband, who not actually is dead, but then again, I talked about this in the last clip, how he could have faked his death, but also that would be difficult. So yeah, there is that. I am enjoying the story, I am intrigued, and I want to know what is happening, but I do think it is a little cliche-filled filled at the for all, I just don't think it has the strong vibe that like Survive the Night had. Now, I know a lot of people did not like Survive the Night. I personally did. I gave that five stars. Um, I really liked the kind of ethereal movie-like quality that Survive the Night had. Um, and so this just doesn't necessarily have that for me. So right now, if I had to rate it, I would say it's probably like an average three, three and a half star thriller. Obviously, once we get to kind of the twist and the climax, the action, we'll see if that moves up or down, depending on how I feel about the twist. But I'm hoping that it's something really, really clever and something that ends up blowing my mind away. So <laughs> I finally finished this book. What to say? What to say? So I stopped. Um, I previously was on page 183 or something like that. Um, and I finished the rest of the book. I read it all in one setting, the back half, this afternoon. So I finished it now um, about six hours ago. And I initially was going to record a clip right after I had finished the book. Um, but I was like, you know what? Two things. One, I want to sit for a bit and think more about it because I had a lot of thoughts. And two, my fiance was napping, so I didn't want to wake him up. All right, let's get into this book. So picking up where I had left off. Um, basically, we were at Catherine, you know, missing. We had been uh, introduced to the three women. They had thought Tom was serial killing. I'm at that part. Um, and then we bring up the wine glass again, which becomes important, which um, I was thinking, you know, that's kind of like a dropped plot point. And I thought initially, oh, it must have just been like red herring, but it does come back in the end. But basically for the next like I don't even know, probably like 20 pages or so. Not a lot happens other than just them kind of like investigating into the other girls and like her and Boone becoming like close, which is all setting up into this like big red herring um, because of basic, basically like um, Tom comes up to Casey's house and is like, hey, you know, what the fuck? You broke into my house. Um, so then eventually Casey is drunk, she falls asleep, and she wakes up to Boone, uh, like, putting her in bed and bringing her breakfast, blah, blah, blah. And then she remembers that when she broke into Tom and Catherine's house, she found a, found Catherine's phone, and on that phone there was a number calling the phone, and, um, Casey took a picture of this number, she calls that number, turns out to be Boone's phone, which I was like, great, great, great. And then we get to a now break, um... And I'm like, okay, if this now does not reveal Boone to be the one tied to the bed, like, I 100% think it has to be the old guy, um, Eli, or her husband is not actually dead. Like, I've been thinking that this entire time, right? So we get to the now, and we're reading, we're reading, and they're just, like, talking, and Casey's trying to get whoever this person is to admit, you know, where they dump the girls, because at this point, we know that this person, who is, whoever it is, is tied to the bed, is the person who is the serial killer, and basically, all this reveals is that we officially now know that it is not Tom tied to the bed, which was pretty obvious from the jump from the start, um, but the last line is, what up do you plan on doing with Tom? So, we flip back to before, and then... Um, Casey and Boone get into a huge fight and she's starting to think Boone is the one who maybe murdered Catherine and she thinks then that maybe Boone also murdered his wife and it, it's just all like a little like at this point I was like Boone is not like that is not what is going to happen so I was just like a little annoyed <laughs> honestly like I had been thinking you know a lot of like what I would potentially rate this book and at this point I was annoyed get to the end of kind of the chapter or like two chapters 
of Casey basically like freaking out. And this is when the book goes completely off the rails for the last 100 pages. And, and so she follows Tom over to the Fitzgerald's house, which is the neighbors of Tom and Catherine um, on the other side of the lake because it's Eli Fitzgerald, Tom and Catherine. And then on the other side of the lake, it's Casey's cabin and Boone's staying in the Mitchell's or Michael's cabin. Uh, but like he is staying next to her. They're on the same side of the lake, blah, blah. So she follows Tom into the Fitzgerald's house. She goes down closer, closer, closer. Um, or like, you know, she's getting closer and closer to like the sound, a creaking sound in the house. She goes down to the basement. She sees Catherine tied to the bed. And I'm like, okay, makes sense. Like, you know, I guess, you know, like I, I didn't think Catherine was dead. I didn't think that that was going to be what happened. But she sees Catherine and she says like, oh, Catherine's voice is weird. And then Tom comes in. He's like, that's not Catherine, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, who is it? And he's like, oh, it's someone else. Tom starts explaining like, oh, do you remember that story? Because there was this story of like the lake being haunted, which I don't think I've mentioned so far because I, I like didn't think it was like a real important part to the story. I thought it was just like to get Casey's mind thinking about her dead husband who had drowned in the lake. And so Tom is like, yeah, like, I think that the lake is actually haunted and that there's like ghosts or whatever in the lake. And then we get to, oh, I don't even know what we get. Like I, at this point I was like, okay, where is this going? Like, what is this book doing? And so like the last line on page 246, if you're not Catherine, I say, then who are you? You know who I am. Her voice has deepened slightly, changing into one that's chillingly familiar. It's me, Len. So I'm like, okay, is like Catherine and Tom like in this, like trying to make Casey go crazy? Like, what is this? She talks to Catherine, who is pretending to be Len, and she gets to, <laughs> she gets Tom to leave the basement. So she tells Len, or Catherine, whatever you want to say, to say something, like tell me something that only we would know. And Catherine says, you sure that you want that C, spelled C-E-E, -E, which is her, Casey's nickname that Len used to use for her. And she flashes back to the last time she spoke to Catherine on the phone and she waved to the window because Casey called Catherine after Tom and Catherine had a fight. And she says, I'm fine, C. And she waves, Catherine waves to Casey from the window. And oh my god and she's like oh my god like she wasn't saying c as in like the word s-e-e -E. she was saying c as in my nickname which was just like fucked up casey says that's not enough i'll need more proof than that and then Catherine says how about this Catherine grins the smiles are spreading like an oil slick across her face i haven't forgotten that you killed me and i was like okay now that i didn't see coming but i was like wait how is this going to happen and then okay well then we flash forward and we officially know that it is like Catherine that is tied to the bed in these flash kind of forward chapters, but it's actually Len in Catherine's body. And he admits that um, he did kill Megan, Tony, and Sue Ellen, the two, the three women. And then we get to the end of this chapter and she says that she's finally believing that this is Leonard Bradley, Len, the man I married and the man I thought I had removed from the face of this earth for good. This is when I became like angry. Like I put the book down for a minute and I told my fiance, he was like, what's wrong? And I was like, I'm just angry. Like, and this beginning chapter opens when I joked with the editor acquaintance of mine about naming her proposed memoir How to Become Tabloid Fodder in Seven Easy Steps, I should have included one more in the title. A secret step tucked like a bookmark between five and six. Discover your husband is a serial killer, which I did the summer we spent at Lake Green. Now I'll tell you why that made me angry. Because this entire prior book, when we had learned about the girls, and when Casey is like, investigating with Boone and we learn that she thinks that Tom or that detective Wilma thinks that Tom is the murderer. Casey is like, oh yeah, yeah. Like, you know, Tom murdered these girls. Like Tom must have murdered Catherine too. When she like full on already knew that her husband is the one who killed the girls, which I will admit I did not expect. Um, I, I really thought that it was going to be Eli uh, who was the serial killer. Um, like, I thought that he was going to have something to do with it. And it turns out he actually was, him and Boone were really, like, fully, fully innocent in this entire novel. They didn't have anything to do 
with the husband's death, with the girl's death. They didn't have anything to do with the weird Catherine and Tom plot lines, which did shock me because I thought they were going to have more to do with it. And really, I'm just like, this book takes in these last, like, just under 100 pages, like 80 or so pages, a real weird turn of becoming completely supernatural because we find out that the lake does have powers to basically transfer souls. So when Catherine drowned the first day that Casey met her, Len's soul went into Catherine's body and took over over the next day or two. Um, and we find out that Casey, basically, she goes down to Len's tackle box, finds the three licenses, licenses, the license, the ID cards for the three women who um, Len had killed with a lock of their hair, paper clips to each license. And so then she decides, well, I have to kill Len because if I end up turning him in and this gets out, like I'm going to ruin my own career. And that's what she does. She basically drugs him using um, like a allergy medication and she puts it in their wine, I think is what they're drinking. And she basically is like, let's go on the boat. And she like gets her out there. She explains that she finally knows and that she doesn't know what to do. Um, and then she pushes him overboard <laughs> and he ends up floundering for a couple of minutes and then drowns and she goes home and basically sets it up like he went out and was drowned. And so I don't know how to feel like, okay, let me just finish. So then we basically get to this point where she helps Catherine escape the basement. She brings her over to her house, ties her up, and that's where we're getting those chapters of them basically talking and trying to get him to admit where he dumped the bodies. Casey is like, I don't know what to do. Eventually, Catherine, as, or Len, whatever you want to say, escapes. Finally, in the very last part, like the last mm, 50 pages, Casey comes up with this plan where basically she is going to kill Len in Catherine's body again. First, she is going to suck Len out of Catherine's body by kissing him in the boat. He takes her to where he dumped the three girls' bodies, and at this point, she has looped in Eli um, and Tom to what is happening. And so she does that, she drowns herself, and then Catherine saves her, and they're like, good, like Len is not in either of them anymore. They release um, Tom, because they, he had been previously locked in the basement of the Fitzgerald house. Then the very last twist of the book is the wine glass comes back because Casey is like, oh, like Catherine was mentioning before, you know, her and Len, like Len took over her body, that she was still feeling bad and not feeling herself. And so, holy crap, Tom actually was trying to kill Catherine. And so then Kath, or Tom attacks Casey and she ends up killing Tom blah blah and then it all is a big happy ending she starts dating Boone there's like a fast forward to New Year's because this book takes place in October so it's like two months and she's stopped drinking and um her Catherine has moved into the house with her and is going to sell her house and her mom and Marnie are suddenly like oh, you're doing so amazing. And after 16 minutes of explaining the the end of this book, the last 16 pages, let me get to my final spoilery thought. The things that I liked about it, I liked the setting. Um, I thought the setting could have been used a lot more. I thought the idea of a secluded lake is really nice, um, but not in a summer camp setting. He had already done that before in The Last Time I Lied. And, like the storm approaching and all of that was really cool. I, I liked that. But then everything else was just like really cliche, like the drunk main character, the unreliable narrator. Um, I did think the twist of her killing Len was cool. Um, and I think Len being the serial killer was cool. I didn't expect that. But then the whole like supernatural element that just comes up into this of like Len like basically possessing Catherine's body through this lake that like has magical powers apparently, like that just seemed out of left field to me and like it came out of nowhere and that you know I I personally like my mystery thrillers such as this to be grounded in reality if this was a supernatural book like a horror book I feel like I could get behind it a little bit more um I'm not a, opposed to him trying this out I think it was an interesting idea 
I just don't think it worked for me and what I personally liked and what I was expecting to going from coming out of this book. And that's definitely fully on me and my own expectations of things and not necessarily the book's fault. Um, do I think that it should be marketed as a supernatural horror? Yes, but then that would fully ruin the twist for you because you would know okay, if there's a supernatural element and they talk about how they suspect that the lake is haunted and that there's something weird going on with the lake and then when you hear Len was drowned in the lake, you're instantly going to think that he is involved in the story somehow, which I think is, like I said, it's shocking. It, it's definitely shocking. It just is a little too over the top, a little too unbelievable, obviously, for me and not how... It just wasn't satisfying, ultimately. This is kind of, I guess, everything that I wanted to say, uh, spoilery resulting in this book, a little reading vlog for it. Will I be mad if he continues going in a supernatural, more horror-adjacent direction? No, I would just like to know that moving forward. Um, and I would like to see this lake be brought up again. Um, like, I definitely would enjoy, I think, a spinoff of this lake set in, like, probably the 50s or the 60s and I'm not a huge fan of like historical fiction so for me to say that like I feel like is weird but um I definitely would like that like seeing maybe like the origins or, or something like just a different take on this kind of story. I know Casey's family has been here for generations so I feel like we should focus on a different family at the lake and just have Casey's family kind of be adjacent to the plot. Let me know what you thought of this book. Let me know what you think of Riley Sagar's back catalog, and I will talk to you next time. Bye.